Good evening, my name is Annemarie Wensing. I'm a clinical virologist from Utrecht, the Netherlands. And I was invited to give an update of a talk that my colleague from London, Ravi Gupta, gave in February, and which is about adapting diagnostics to SARS-CoV-2 viral variants. These are my disclosures from the last three years. And if you take a look at SARS um, evolution ever since uh, the start of the epidemic, Although um, the coronaviruses are an exception within the RNA viruses that they do have proofreading, their evolution is still significant with about 26 substitutions over a year. And this graph of uh, next strain really nicely um, illustrates the upcoming of different variants. And in blue, you see the alpha variant, so the UK variant popping up, and they're now going to be displaced by the delta variant. You can also picture this in a different way, like Monte Wolferton did in this um, almost scary graphic with COVID and the variants, which are performing tonight and will never disappear. I hope that's really not a really good forecast. So what about these novel variants? Well, they could potentially affect neutralization by antibodies. They can have influence on the efficacy of treatment, transmissibility or disease severity. But for this talk, most importantly, they can also influence diagnostic capacity. And based on potential impact uh, on global health, WHO and CDC categorize novel variants in three severity classes. Variants of interest, variants of concern, and variants of high consequence. And if we look at uh, the current um, overview of these variants of interest and concern, and this is really nicely retrieved from the WHO, HO website, which is updated regularly, and this you can see this last edition was actually from June 14, in which we now to the Greek letter lambda uh, with variants of interest. Up here you see the four uh, variants of concern that we probably all know by now: alpha, beta, gamma, delta, delta. With delta, the new kit on the block from India, which uh, brings indeed a lot of concern. So what is now the relation with this classification and the impact on diagnostic tools? Of course, this classification is very much driven by influence of these novel variants on pathogenesis and immune escape. But if we look in particular to diagnostics, variants of interest may have a potential diagnostic impact, for instance, because there are mutations in the target size of diagnostics. Um, variants of concern may also have a diagnostic detection failure. It doesn't mean that all variants of concern have this problem because they may also be variants of concern because of a concern about immune escape or pathogenesis. But if they would have this classification purely on the uh, influence on diagnostic tools, then it would be a variant of concern if there would be diagnostic detection failure. If, a diagnostic, uh, if the diagnostics would fail at all, you would talk about a variant of high consequence, because of course it will be very difficult to follow the epidemic at that time point, and diagnose patients. It's important to realize that failure to detect is not the same as failure of diagnostics. And this is really nicely illustrated by a French study from Pierre Villatre. And um, he describes an outbreak um, in France uh, of the variant B1616. And he describes 34 cases with clinical and radiological findings of COVID. But uh, in only 50% of these 34 cases, the nasal pharyngeal swab was positive for SARS CoV 2. Um, if they took deeper material from these patients, actually the PCR was positive. So somehow this variant was not detected by the usual way of, of um, swapping. And it seemed that actually the failure to detect this variant um, had to do with a very low viral load of this particular variant in many patients in the upper respiratory tract, rather than genomic mismatches between RT-PCR targets and this particular variant. So we can conclude from that that the impact of viral genetic mutations on the performance of a diagnostic test is influenced by various factors. It can be the viral load. If a variant um, results in a very low viral load, the test may be less um, efficient. Uh, but also the design of the test, the choice of primers is, is particularly relevant. 
and the prevalence of a variant in the population. You have a diagnostic escape variant, but it doesn't really um, gain dominance in the population because it's not fit enough. Um, and the problem is, of course, minor compared to if the dominant variant is not detected well. And also the sequence of the variant um, is important because even silent mutations that not um, induce an amino acid change can still be relevant and result in failure of a diagnostic test. If we look at the four mutational profiles from the currently variants of concern, and this is a nice overview from Stanford team, um, which is of course doing lots of interesting work um, on HIV and now also on SARS, um, you see really the spike gene uh, highlighted because that's of course what we all focus on because of immune escape or possible immune escape. But for all these variants, you see actually there are mutations in different uh, areas of the genome of the virus. For instance, in the nucleocapsid or in ORF1AB or at the envelop at different uh, places, there are actually mutations. So when do we really see escape from detection from PCR or other nucleic acid amplification tests? So it all has to do, of course, with the primers. These are the short DNA sequences that bind and detect specific virus RNA target sequences. And if a mutation in the virus occurs in such a primer, and that's really the target region of the assays, the actually the amplification may be prohibited. And then you can have a false negative result of your test. Fortunately, uh, this was of course foreseen by many of the um, suppliers of these tests. And most of the tests are actually designed to have multiple primer target regions sometimes in the, same, in the same gene, but often also in different genes. Um, so if you have a test which seems to have only one um, uh, target, it may still be that in this one target there are like three different primers. And if a mutation does occur in one primer target site, it does not necessarily have to lead to a failure of a test. The test may be still accurate. We look at the different targets that these NAID tests use, actually you see quite some variations. Some of the assays use ORF or Spike or Envelope or Matrix or Nucleocapsid. So there's quite a differentiation between different assays. Um, however, we have to realize that for already the Spike gene, the Envelope and the N gene dropouts have been reported. But these dropouts does not have to result in failure of detection. I'll show you in two cases. Here you see an example of an e-gene escape, a very nice paper from Artesi in clinical microbiology, where they actually use the COVA system, which is a dual target assay, targeting both ORF1AB and the e-gene. And they had a subset of eight samples uh, with positive test results. So the, the, the assay, the Ross assay was perfectly able to detect the SARS-CoV-2 cases. However, if you look really in detail to the test results, what they saw was actually was no amplification of the E gene. This was all zero. And the positive test result was solely based on the ORF1 target RDRP. Uh, if they took four of these samples to another assay, actually they saw amplification of both genes. And um, they thought, um, of course, the primers of the commercial uh, assay are unfortunately not available, but they thought that a transition at one particular position in the genome actually resulted in failure of the e-gene amplification in the COBAS test. However, this particular mutation did not lead to failure of the e-gene amplification in another test, which means that failure in one assay doesn't mean failure in all assays that have the same target gene. It's really primer specific. If you look at S-gene escape, um, various variants um, among the, uh, but also the alpha, the UK variant, have a mutation, a, a deletion at uh, position 69, 70 from the spike gene. And that actually leads to S gene target in several assays because it's a real deletion, it probably has effect in, in several assays. And what you can do then, and that has been done with the Thermo Fisher assay really nicely, this is also an assay with multiple targets that you can actually use this assay to, um, to select or to detect these variants. 
because you see one of the ver one of the targets not amplified in the PCR. And this um, graph from um, publication from Washington really nicely shows actually the upcoming in the States from this um, UK variant and the S gene dropouts in the essays. So they did detect those cases of SARS um, um, infection, but uh, in their test, they saw that the S gene was not amplified. And they could actually, uh, in that way, indirectly conclude the upcoming of the new variant. Actually, now there are more assays that actually can be used um, to detect a subset of variants. And this is a really nice assay. This slide was shared by Rolf Kaiser from the University of Cologne. And they have made a melting point assay, which has a very short turnaround time from only two hours. And they can depict in two rounds multiple different variants based on particular mutations, which actually gives them the opportunity to, in a really short time, detect which variants is present without having to go to full genome sequencing. Actually, there's also a commercial assay who can do this. This is the CGene two-step RT-PCR. It has an automatic analysis. It's also very uh, capable of um, detecting a subset of variants. Of course, these approaches should now and then be followed up by sequence analysis because uh, you, of course, only find in these particular assays the variants that you have designed um, your assays for. What about escape from antigen or antibody detection? Um, these assays could also be affected by viral variation. But we have to realize to have really an influence on the test result the variation should cause an alteration to the protein or physical structure of the virus targeted by the test. The antibody tests that are available can recognize uh, responses to different um, proteins depending on the assay that you have a look at. It could be nucleocapsid, envelope, or spike proteins. Whether the sensitivity of serologic tests may decrease is actually currently not known. It's very difficult to assess uh, in this state. For the antigen test, which mostly targets the nucleocapsid uh, protein, since this is a, an, a target that's stably associated with the RNA in the virion and present in a very high copy number in active infections, um, it's a little bit of a different story. Uh, fortunately, many uh, um, people have already looked into the performance of these antigen tests for different variants. And here you see two publications um, from Lindner and from Public Health um, England mixed together, they've looked at all these different antigen tests and looked at either only the alpha or the beta variant. And all these tests are perfectly able to detect these different variants. And soon we probably will have results for the performance of these tests on the delta variant. Was there escape described from antigen detection? Well, I found one paper um, that actually describes a thousand-fold loss in sensitivity. So not completely failure, but really um, a lack of um, detection of um, samples with a certain viral load. And that was with the Credo-Sovia SARS antigen test. And it was associated with one particular mutation in the nucleocapsid. Other tests like the Abbott Binax or a different test from the same uh, company were actually not affected by this mutation. So again, as we have seen with the uh, molecular test that a mutation that affects one assay does not have to affect other assays. Uh, fortunately, this mutation is, is, is very uh, uncommon and has only been detected in 0, 0.0 of the genomes worldwide. So this is hardly uh, a very uh, serious problem. So if you want to follow up about these new variants, and if you want to be sure that the test that you use is still relevant, there are two really nice pages. The FDA has an alert page, which they really describe the uh, effects of viral variants on the different COVID tests. And uh, I think it's a very useful page. Also, the WHO has an alert page. And for instance, at this page, you can see the variants of concern and their impact on diagnostics. And then you can see that there is no uh, impact on diagnostics report today for the Delta variant. And what we already discussed, the S gene target failure uh, for the Alpha variant is nicely um, uh, described here. So these are very useful pages if you would like to track down 
and whether your diagnostics are still um, accurate in the changing epidemic. So in conclusion, quite some variants have mutations in target regions for diagnostic tests, but there is limited impact on the vinyl results of most diagnostic tests. Currently, there's not enough data on the effect of variation of serological testing. And we have specific assays that can function as a rapid indicator of the presence of novel variants that may make life more easy and prevent us from um, having to do um, uh, sequence analysis in every case. However, we have to um, be assured that all countries have in place genomic surveillance and the possibility of rapid identification of new mutations because these uh, rapid indicator assays do not allow us to uh, assess these new variants. And it's very important because um, the effects that variants may have on diagnostics are utterly essential. Um, we have to be able to follow um, the epidemic and um, uh, diagnose the cases that are relevant. So finally, would like to acknowledge my colleague Rolf Kaiser from the University of Cologne and my colleague Henrik Gemmels from the University of Utrecht. Thank you so much.